Let's say we have a 57-year-old man with a medical history significant for angina and hypertension presents because of worsening chest pain. He treats each episode with sublingual nitroglycerin, but has noticed that over the past year, the frequency of his episodes has increased from once a week to daily. A note in the chart indicates that the patient is allergic to metoprolol, so a calcium channel blocker is added to the patient's regimen. Which calcium channel blocker is most indicated? In this lecture, we will explain the mechanism of action of calcium channel blockers, identify the clinical uses for calcium channel blockers, and identify some of the adverse reactions that we can expect with calcium channel blocker use. The main difference between the dihydropyridines and non-dihydropyridines, besides the non in the beginning of the name, is that the dihydropyridines block the calcium channels on smooth muscles, while the non-dihydropyridines tend to favor calcium channels on the heart. Let's talk mechanism of action first. Recall that L-type calcium channels are located in the myocardium and are also responsible for pacemaker cell depolarization. Our non-dihydropyridines, verapamil and diltiazem, bind voltage-gated L-type calcium channels of the individual myocytes and also the pacemaker cells. This image from the cardiophysiology section is our cardiomyocyte, and on its sarcolemma, we can see the L-type calcium channels that we are going to block. This will drop contractility because there will be a decrease in the amount of intramyocyte calcium. Remember, the amount of calcium directly relates to contractile ability. Verapamil is more selective for the L-type calcium channels in the myocardium than diltiazem. These guys are also useful for binding the calcium channels that pacemaker cells use for their phase zero depolarization. If we bind the calcium channels responsible for the upstroke in phase zero, we are going to drop the rate at which we create and conduct depolarizations. This is why verapamil and diltiazem are useful in situations in which we want to drop AV nodal conduction speed, like AFib or A flutter. Why do we want to decrease AV nodal conduction speed in the situation of AFib or A flutter? That's because we do not want every single depolarization from the atria transmitted into the ventricles. Calcium channel blockers help increase the refractoriness of the AV node. Now, we shift gears into the dihydropyridines. They all end in dipine. These guys preferentially block vascular smooth muscle cells with less effect on the myocardial calcium channels, except amlodipine and nifedipine, which have equal affinity for both types of calcium channels. The dihydropyridines are more selective for vascular smooth muscle cells, so their clinical utility is for vascular tone issues, such as in hypertension, and in spastic or Prinz metal, angina, or Raynaud phenomenon. Let's apply this to see how we use this principle to treat a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage. This patient wasn't very lucky and suffered a ruptured cerebral aneurysm. Remember, there are three layers covering the brain from outside to in. It's the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia mater. The subarachnoid hemorrhage means that blood is hemorrhaging into the space below the arachnoid. Blood will irritate the cerebral vessels and can increase the risk of vasospasm. What type of calcium channel blocker would you use? Would you use one like verapamil that has a high cardioselectivity? Or one like nimodipine that mainly antagonizes vascular smooth muscle channels? Nimodipine is the way to go because we need a dihydropyridine that will inhibit the calcium channels on the vascular smooth muscles of the cerebral vessels. In addition, you can give the dihydropyridines or a non-dihydropyridine for someone in the situation of hypertension 
because they will both drop the blood pressure, but in different ways. Remember the equation. Blood pressure equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. Your dihydropyridines will tend to drop blood pressure by arterial vasodilation, leading to a drop in total peripheral resistance. The non-dihydropyridines will tend to cause a decrease in the cardiac output by decreasing the heart rate and contractility. Medications like nicardipine and clavidipine are useful in hypertensive urgency because they have a fast onset and a short duration. You want to quickly drop these patients' blood pressures, but if you overshoot, you also want the drug to be metabolized quickly so that you can readjust your dosing regimen. The toxicities associated with these drugs are directly related to their mechanisms. The cardiac depression and AV block caused by our non-dihydropyridines, verapamil and diltiazem, should be rather obvious to us because we are directly blocking the calcium channels that are responsible for the intrinsic depolarization rate of the cells that control heart rate. The peripheral edema, flushing, and dizziness are all related to vasodilation. If you dilate your vessels, you can increase the fluid shifting across your vessel wall into the interstitium, leading to edema. Flushing is because you increase the diameter of the skin vessels, increasing the flow of red blood in the skin. This side effect makes the person look very red like a cherry. The dizziness is a combination of a drop in cardiac output and total peripheral resistance, causing hypoperfusion to the brain. The constipation is associated with the calcium channel antagonism of the interstitial cells of Kajal. Do you remember what these cells are responsible for? The interstitial cells of Kajal set the baseline depolarizations of the intestinal smooth muscle and control gut peristalsis. A unique adverse effect that isn't completely understood is gingival hyperplasia. The last adverse reaction is high yield because it lets the test question writers bring in some endocrinology. Hyperprolactinemia classically occurs due to verapamil. How in the world does verapamil lead to an increase in prolactin levels? Well, the arcuate nucleus in the hypothalamus has neuroendocrine neurons that produce dopamine and then packages it into vesicles. The release of dopamine from the vesicles is dependent on calcium influx. Verapamil is the bad guy here and inhibits this calcium influx. What happens when we do not have enough dopamine to bind and inhibit the lactotrophs of the anterior pituitary? Well, they are not inhibited from producing prolactin, leading to hyperprolactinemia. Flash quiz time. Among the calcium channel blockers, which acts most like nitrate in treating angina, and which acts most like a beta blocker? The answers would be nifedipine and verapamil, respectively. Remember that the dipenes will drop blood pressure by arteriolar dilation, while the non-dihydropyridines will tend to cause a decrease in the cardiac output by decreasing heart rate and contractility. In this video, we learned that calcium channel blockers come in two different flavors, the dihydropyridine and non-dihydropyridines. The dipenes tend to work on vascular smooth muscle, while non-dipenes work more on cardiac myocytes. Some of the associated adverse drug reactions include edema, flushing, cardiac depression, and the rare gingival hyperplasia. Thanks for watching, and be sure to click thumbs up if you enjoyed this video.